The Roundtable has assembled once again for today's season finale of The Producer Podcast as we journey back to the world of commercial filmmaking. Joining us again on the show, we have Ethan Hill, Hunter Starnes, and Timothy Schutz here to discuss the world of commercial and promo filmmaking in Roundtable style, including some listener-submitted questions. So without further ado, let's get started. Thank you, Hunter, Ethan, and Timothy for coming on the show today. Sort of thing. Glad Thanks to be here. Having us. Glad to be here. You've all been on the show before, so we're not going to get into how you all got started making films and that. People can go listen to those other episodes if they want to hear your backstory. Um, but I thought kind of a fun icebreaker question would be uh, to just share, like, why have you decided to work in this more client realm of the industry instead of being in the narrative side where like you're in complete control and can really be creative as some people would say. Better pay. I mean, that's it for me. I'll be honest, the better, better pay. If people uh, will pay me to do, um, you know, client work and work for them. Um, I'm not getting at the moment, I'm not getting paid for, the kind of work that um, I guess would be more creative that I would want to do. So ultimately, ultimately, that's what it is. You know, you ask yourself, what do you really want? You know, and for me, it was, I want to take care of my family and want to um, have that income to do so and still be in the field, which I love still being behind the camera for the most part. Um, and so it allows me to have the passion of being behind the camera. And at the same time, the passion of just caring for my family. Um, and so that's a short answer for me. Yeah, and I definitely piggyback off that, uh, the pay is definitely a big part of it. And I think most of us probably got into filmmaking, at least myself personally, uh, for the fun of the short films, the narrative films, the feature films, whatnot, and then, you know, naturally pivot into, work that pays a little more that pays it all and uh makes a yeah just makes it more feasible as far as a career goes yeah i mean pay obviously <laughs> um but i think i also i would say as well like the when i was working in the feature space it was so much more stressful um you know where you were getting your next job or you know even when you're on a set like just like just the stress of the set itself and so while obviously corporate work has a lot of stress and a lot of deadlines, it's a lot easier, in my opinion, to maintain a consistent lifestyle, you know, setting boundaries and being able to spend more time with family, you know, having dedicated weekends off, you know, that kind of thing, which obviously can happen in the film space. But it's it's a lot easier to be like, oh, we need to shoot on a Saturday or something like that, because that's the only time that we've got everyone here and the location can do it, you know. So that's been a huge benefit for us and my family of just like, that's, I mean, why we made that shift was just the regularity and the consistency and being able to have set patterns a lot more. I, I will say, I agree. The pay is <laughs> definitely a uh, nice factor of that. I can, yeah, probably count on one hand, the amount of narrative projects I actually was paid for. Uh, the rest have all been uh volunteer blood sweat and tears <laughs> and the narrative projects are a lot of fun to do like don't get me wrong if i could like i have no uh regrets about any of the narrative projects that i have been a pleasure to be a part of but um you know i'm not at the point in my career where i can be paid for doing that kind of work um, others have and make a career out of it. And I think that that is amazing and great. That's just not the path that God has led me down for various reasons. And, um, you know, someday though, the goal is to make enough money at commercial work, um, wedding work, whatever it might be in order to spend more time on passion projects, whether that be narrative or, documentary or things like that so yeah, yeah I, would, I, would, willing. 
I, well, I would add to that that it's like I don't think I know of a single person in the corporate space that doesn't have something on the back burner that they want to do eventually, you know, something narrative or, you know, even if it isn't specifically like, oh, I want to go make a feature film or a short film, you know, doing a spec piece or something that's like, that's not just the standard corporate, you know, making a video for someone else, so to speak, or a project for someone else. It's I want to do something that is my idea, you know, so I think that's always there to some degree, but yeah, it's the, the, the necessity definitely comes into play. It's like, okay, cool. Well, at some point that'd be nice to do, but not right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. One other thing, I think commercial often gets a bad rap just for the lack of creativity and on a lot of projects, I guess that is true, but there is a certain amount of, I'll often include in my pitch for a client, for a project, I'll include like a wild card um proposal and that will just be what i think would be a great way to solve whatever problem is that they're having with some random video whether it's a story or whether it's just something way out there oftentimes okay not often sometimes the <laughs> client will actually go for it <laughs> that's a neat that's... idea i know some people i'd be scared to share that idea with <laughs> um but uh yeah no that's that's cool that is also um how i got a recent um corporate gig with a architecture um, company here in the Dallas area. Um, I pitched them a wild, wild to me idea of doing um, architecture projects like a car commercial, like a Lexus car commercial or something like that. And just, you know, really kind of elevate their brand. And um, while that is still in the works, I did two other projects with them and they just ended up being typical, you know, very typical corporate videos of, you know, like these are interviews and then these, this is B roll of their, the building and people enjoying the building and things like that. So um, the goal is to take it to the next level eventually. And they love the concept that I pitched to them. And that's partly what got me the job. But at the same time, it's like, well, this is what I was, this is what I had to work with. And this was the best way moving forward. And the client ended up liking what I produced anyway. Myself, I was a little disappointed that I wasn't able to take it to the next level. But again, that's going to be me on every project. I'm going to be a little bit disappointed in myself, you know, <laughs> about how I didn't succeed in my mind, you know. Um, but I think having those big ideas and being excited about the work that you are pitching to clients is a good attitude to have and something that I think will impress them and hopefully get you more work. I have found that to be the case anyway. Since we, we kind of got on their pitching projects to clients, stuff like that. Um, another topic I wanted to hit was um, just how do you guys decide if you even have the capacity to take on another project. You don't I don't have, <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, I don't have those safeguards. So I, I've got nothing. Sorry. I just try to make it happen. And I would say editing the amount of editing that's in the backlog is usually a deterrent to having projects done. Um, or I should say having the time to work on the projects that I want to do. Um, but I will try to make something happen and you, and usually, you know, I'll do it to the client's satisfaction, but maybe not always to my satisfaction. So, mm -hmm. but I, I'm sure everyone here can relate to that, you know? Yeah. And I think if there is a project that's coming down and I'm not sure if I can take it on, I'll usually either try to negotiate the timeline to fit it into my schedule in a slot that works. Or I'll recommend somebody that I think would be a good fit for it. Yeah, I think it's interesting because I think I'm in a little bit different position than um, than everyone else on this call because I'm not doing my own projects per se. I'm managing projects for other people. Um, so our, my approach with managing projects and like when we're looking at taking on a new client is looking at what our existing work is, figuring out who's doing what, you know, giving a little bit of buffer you know, if someone gets sick or something and then dra deadlines drag out there. And then that's our base starting point of figuring out, okay, how long, where do we have the hours to fit in this new uh, client or new project? And 
then from there looking at what the timetable for a new project because every project has a different scope and scale and so figuring out what the scope and scale would be how it fits in with the existing plan and then i try to build in at least you know a week or two of buffer um around stuff and pretty consistency consistently it always um <laughs> it always gets eaten up um and ble you know even <laughs> bleeding into the time frames of what the next part project was supposed to start in um but yeah i think the biggest thing is just trying to get a good grasp on how long your existing work takes and then you know what's on your plate already and then planning extra margin around that so then you can accurately take it on and also like to that degree as well you know i'm a very logistically minded person so my immediate response when i hear a new client like talking about coming on is like no 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 we can't do it but it's really trying you know getting in the headspace of yeah how can we make this happen we want to make it happen you know obviously we may have to adjust time frames from what they're wanting to do it in but obviously we want to try to make something happen so trying to come at from that perspective than the immediate response of panicking or freaking out. In that same vein of things, um, what does make you want to turn a project down if, if something comes in and you're like, nope, going to pass on this one? What are, what are some of those either signs you're seeing from the client or related to just maybe the type of project it is? Maybe the client's great, but that project particularly you don't want to do why i know for me it's often a couple things uh first one would be like misalignment of values if we're not lined up on the values of what they're looking for out of the project that'll often uh, determine that also i mean budget is a big one so if they have the budget don't have the budget uh there's some other local filmmakers so i can recommend them to if it's if it's something that's not in my in my budget range there and then also, just is it something that I'm comfortable or feel confident that I can actually solve or produce for them? Because if it's something that's in a specialty that I don't necessarily have and I don't feel comfortable taking it on, I might pass on it. Yeah, I think uh, exactly what Ethan said. Um, I would also say sometimes just the tone, the way that uh, inquiry comes in just leads me to question whether they actually know what they want. And so how much time do I want to spend guiding this client and how much, um, how much trouble are they going to be? And can I even help them? I, I spent maybe a year doing, um, just meetings with the client here in uh, Fort Worth. And this was during COVID. So I didn't have a whole lot else going on. And the meeting meetings were great. I loved, loved the organization, loved the, you know, um, the guy, the owner of the organization. Um, but we ended up just not doing anything for him just because he couldn't decide what he wanted. And at the end of the day, I had to, we just had to come to the agreement of, well, we've talked about all these different things we could do. Um, it sounds like video is just not the right move for you, or at least I'm not the right guy for you at the moment and uh while i was paid for those meetings with him it was consulting fee you know it wasn't a lot and it didn't lead to the work that i wanted to do but it would have um at the end of the day that was the right call because it would have led to so much more work and the client didn't know what he wanted so if we had produced something j just anything and if i would just been like well let's just produce something and trust us like he might not have liked it and that would not have served the client very well. Um, so going back to, you know, do you want to guide this client? You know, do you want to be Gandalf leading, you know, a bunch of hobbits through Middle Earth? You know, if you're going to do that, you want to make sure they're the right hobbits. And, you know, they're not, I don't know, orcs or something. Um, but uh, I would say that, Oftentimes you can figure that out in the first phone call and you just get better at it. I'm still not great at it, but you get better at it the more projects you do and the more time you spend with clients. So I have to ask, since you brought up Middle Earth, uh, does that mean you also have your uh, your pack of eagles that you can call in on projects? <laughs> Absolutely. 
Um, I have never thought of my brother as an eagle before, but I he definitely comes to my aid as well as other people that I have uh, friends and everything. So yeah, I have been saved by those people multiple times. Yeah, I'll I'll add to um, what Hunter was saying about you know guiding. You know, I think there's a basic level of guiding because of the nature. You know, we're we're specialists in a in our fields. You know, and so we're coming to the client. We don't. There's not an expectation that the client will know how to do our job. You know, that's why we exist. Why we're getting paid to do what we do. But there's definitely a level of like, oh yeah, I'm gonna have to invest a lot of time because they don't know what to tell me. I can't run with anything because they don't know what they want. want as you know, as the end product. And so that can be, you know, we're, we, we, we have a client, you know, where we, we, we tried to vet them, you know, we tried to figure out what the, what the timetables would be. And it's ended up being just, they haven't known fully what they want. And so they haven't told us that when they give us feedback on revisions of different things. And so it's ended up just dragging out work with them because they're going through, you know, they're getting it approved by multiple levels of people. And, you know, it's one of those things I think in hindsight, we would we would have probably avoided maybe working with them. Obviously, we're going, we are working with them and we're going to give them the best that we can. But yeah, it's definitely sometimes you don't always catch it ahead of time. And so you just, you're stuck with trying to get it finished, you know, get everything finished up in a good quality way. But yeah, I think that like, trying to, you know, jumping back to the original question as well of how do you, you know, know when to say no, like everything that was mentioned is totally on point. I think, you know, budget and resources and everything. And I think that ultimately um, sometimes you just look at what they are wanting out of it as well. And whether you're the best person to deliver that for them, even if it, even if the money's there, even if, you know, you're on the same page in terms of them as a company and, you know, values lining up. Sometimes literally you're not the best company to do that for that. You try to do everything you can for them, but, you know, there's certain companies that specialize in different things and it's just like, hey, we're just not the best fit for you, what your needs are. And so that's also has played into some decisions at times as well. So, yeah. And that's something that you learn as you go on where to put safeguards and fences, um, especially with clients who you might not have vetted well enough, um, who you end up working for, and then you end up, you know, doing countless revisions, you, you learn very quickly to only include a certain number of revisions in your quote and to start charging more and things like that. And, you know, that, um, and being on time with bill payments and things like that, um, you learn very quickly that that is a thing. And you need to do that as a business. Um, and then, yeah, just everything Timothy said was really good. Like, I think there's a there's a little bit of self-examination that has to happen. And you have to know your strengths and your weaknesses in order to help clients. And the more that you know yourself, then the more you're going to be able to help your clients and also make sure that you work on jobs that keep you happy and sane, you know, as a creative, um, you know, sometimes it is just about, do I really want to do this project or am I just doing it because of the money or because there is a, um, you know, because I'm afraid because my bank account is low or I don't have any gigs lined up currently. I have certainly been bitten before where I would book, um, a lower paying job because my calendar was free and I acted out of fear and then something else bigger came along and I ended up having to stick with the lower paying job, you know, just because of reputation and, and that was the right thing to do. Um, and, you know, I, I give discounts oftentimes for, you know, if there's a last minute gig and it's like, this is our budget and I'm available and I don't, if I don't mind doing it, I'll take those. Um, or even if I know typically I'm going to be not busy in January or August, like those are my slowest months, then I may take um, a lower paying gig months in advance just to, you know, fill a, a historically low time. Um, but that self-examination helps you avoid some of the other pitfalls of just taking work just because it's available. 
and to what Timothy just said that it just um, that is something that I think comes with experience and also um, hopefully um, you have a mentor or compadres who you can just call upon and, and ask, you know, those, those tough questions and, and learn from them. This is one of our listener submitted questions. Uh, and it still kind of has to do with that start, even, even stuff you're discussing in that onboarding pro process through pre-production, but just, um, like question is like, what's your pre-production time frames look like like do you have a standard rule of thumb that regardless of the project it's always going to be at least this many weeks before we, you would ever be shooting or is it something that's you never know until the concept is greenlit how long you're going to be taking for pre-pro pre-pro is never long enough sorry <laughs> go ahead <Yeah. laughs> amen you know what he said <laughs> Um, for most of my projects, it's going to depend so much on the project and the complexity of it. Um, so yeah, I don't think there's really one answer on my end. Just depends. Yeah. Same for me. It just depends on what I'm allowed to do. Um, whether, you know, allowed for budget reasons, you know, do I really want to spend this amount of time on a low budget project for pre-production or just because we're shooting, you know, we need to do this ASAP and there's not a lot of time for pre-production. I'm honestly not, um, I don't run into that situation that often. So I don't have a ton to add to that, but for me, it just depends on the client and, you know, making sure that the client understands if you don't have time for pre-production, um, if you need more time for, for pre-production, just being, you know, clear in your communication with them. Um, and then understanding that, you know, we can rush through the pre-production, but the quality of the production might suffer. So mm -hmm. I think it's just being honest with yourself and honest with your client and doing that through communication. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add to that as well, that like, sometimes it's like a, oh yeah, we, you know, you can, it's the, the, the good old fashioned triangle of, you know, faster, cheaper quality, you know? And so like, it's definitely like, yeah, we can rush through this, but yeah, like Hunter said, the quality is not going to be there. You know, we can throw more money at it and throw more people at the problem, but that doesn't mean that the problems are all going to be solved because sometimes some problems just take more time. So, I mean, I think in terms of scale and time frames, usually, I mean, we usually try to give for most of our projects, we try to shoot for at least a month. I think um, usually we're able to get a little bit more than that, but lots of times that's not even enough <laughs> um, on the scope of the projects. So it just, it really depends on the, you know, logistics of are you, do you have people traveling in? Is it literally, we're just going to go take a camera and just go shoot out something, you know, or, you know, are we going to just get a, you know, tractor out and just shoot this attachment, you know, on it, you know, and just, or on ice or whatever, you know, that's, basically takes no pre-pro because it's just like, okay, we got the attachment, you got a camera, cool, let's go shoot it just outside, you know? But if you're doing a big, you know, we're flying in crew from all over the United States and we're having to organize with, you know, these different logistical moving pieces, then it's like, okay, let's put in a lot more time and budget too to get all the pieces figured out. So um, I don't think there's a hard, fast rule for how much time to budget for it. It's just, it's a little bit of a moving target and a learning thing of figuring out how much time you need to allocate based upon the project size itself. And as you learn how to, as you do more of it, you learn how much time you need to do pre-production on certain projects. And so including that in your overall quotes, you can pay yourself for those are very important. So but again, that happens through trial and error. I would be curious, just kind of on that topic too, to hear like, what are the, kind of the biggest factors you guys then look at? Since for most of you, it's also fluid based on the project. So what factors are you looking at to decide? Is this a three-week pre-pro project or is this a one-week you know, we can get it all done. Assuming that like you have, like you're not like up against the clock on when like say the event or whatever is actually happening. And that's what's forcing your hand. 
probably the number of moving variables within it. So the amount of amount of people you're bringing on as far as the crew, um, the number of locations, the number, yeah, I guess is the more moving variables you have, probably the more pre-production it's gonna take. Um, I might also, depending on the project, if it's one where they're working with a smaller budget, uh, just try to schedule it tighter. So don't allow yourself as much time because I notice the more time I have in the schedule, the more time I will put towards the project. And if it's not ultimately going to pay off in the long run, as far as the budget goes, then you might be better served just to tighten it up and try to make it, keep it moving. I would say, uh, you know, it, it sort of ties in, but you know, uh, shoot days as well. Like, I mean, that plays into all that as well. You know, there's, there's so much of the details, right. That whenever you are just starting at looking, you know, you've pitched the project and you're just looking, you know, it's approved and you're now starting the early stages of pre-production. It's like sometimes hard to tell like exactly what the numbers are. You don't know where you're going to have to pull crew from. You don't know all this stuff, but usually you can take, you know, a good couple hours and just, okay, let's just ballpark. Let's figure out a bunch of these details. It's not going to be final by any means, but then you can get a lot better estimate of, okay, what are we actually looking at scope-wise here? Um, and a lot of that process does happen when you're pitching the project or should happen when you're pitching the project because then you have on your end, you know what the scale is. You know what to be expecting. But um, yeah, I think it's... I think it really, and budget does come into play a lot of how long you can play. Like Ethan said, like if it is a smaller budget, you just have to be like, cool, how can we make this shorter? So that way this doesn't drag out. And yeah, it may not be perfection. Like, you know, I'd like it to be, but it's at least getting done and they're going to be happy with the end. The, the client's going to be happy with the end product and ultimately is going to serve them well. You know, that's, that's really the end goal is that it's actually serving the client and not just, oh, shoot, they sunk a bunch of money into this project and it didn't pan out. So not only, I mean, everything what Timothy said, but also making sure that, and again, this this goes back to how much experience you have to it, but, but like set a, set a time limit for yourself, even though the client might not have set a limit. Like, I think it would be smart to realize how much budget, how much you're actually going to be paid for this and then realize, okay, this is how much I have to work on this. So set limits for yourself. Um, setting limits actually helps you to, and, and I'm, I'm saying this as I am the worst person to set limits, but this is something that I have come to realize about myself that I need to get better at. So I've been thinking a lot about it, but setting limits, boundaries, so that it forces you to spend more time on what's truly important. Um, so I, th I think that that is, that's good. Again, that comes with, um, with, uh, experience, but just have an idea in your head of this is how much time I can spend on this project. Cause this is how much the budget is. And, um, I'm not going to spend any more on it and try to try to make, you know, good things happen with, the time that you have allotted yourself. And I will say that also depends on how excited you are about the project too. You know, like if you're really excited about the project and it's a little bit of, you know, passion meets um, paid work, which does happen. And it's pretty great when it does, um, you know, give yourself a little bit of extra time to work on it, but that's your call, but do practice setting boundaries, which I am trying to do in my own life right now. So anyway, do do as I say, not as I do, I guess. Um, I need to follow my own advice. So anyway. Yeah, on that on that same topic, I think even if it's not just boundaries, but even if you're just tracking the amount of time you're putting into something so that you can look back on this project and figure out, oh, I spent this much on this much. I should probably work on that. I know for me, I brought on a video editor to do a lot of my video editing. And it is interesting seeing, okay, I didn't know I spent that much time on this sort of a project. You know, this is good for me because when I go into budgeting the next project, I need to, you know, be aware of that and budget accordingly. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, just breaking down projects you've already done, it would probably be a great indicator of how much you're going to need in the future. Yeah, I mean, that, and that's even exactly where we're at as a company of like trying to actively document how long things are taking. 
um, you know, especially with different, we've got different skill levels that are working on different aspects. You get, may get a video editor that's not as experienced as the guy that's on our team doing the majority of our video edits. And so he can do a video edit like three to four times faster than this other guy. But, you know, we try to budget when we pitch to the client, hey, yeah, this is the video that we're doing that we've got enough budget for this other guy to do it. But so that way we can look at when we're even pitching initially okay, how much is this going to actually take time-wise, you know, if we have so-and-so work on this project or how much time does it take me to work on it? Um, so, yeah, I think, honestly, having time management lots of times gets a bad rep for, you know, oh, it's being so constrictive, but the reality is is time management helps you as you're doing projects to be able to do them even better because then you are able to look at your schedule and go, okay, this is – I need to dedicate this time to working on this and you can go all out during that time. You know, that's your time to go all out for that project. But then once you've hit that time, cool, you know, where, where we need to move on to the next thing. Um, and then I would also add with that, you know, I margin is a huge, like, I feel like that's like my big, like if I had a billboard assigned to me, that would be what my billboard would say is make margin in your life. Am I still working on that? Yeah, but um, it's a huge thing because then if something comes up with the project, then you've got that margin built in. Because like I, I've yet to be on a project where something did not come up that was unforeseen. And so like you may have everything planned out logistically for the actual planning, but then something comes up unexpectedly. You know, you're sick one day or whatever. And so it's like you can't work around that, you know, lots of times. And so you just have to have margin so that way you don't get backlog and then you're further behind and you're trying to work on the backlog and then something else comes up and just just can just starts an avalanche of just being behind which you don't want yes i think this will this one will be interesting um to hear from you guys but how involved are your clients on like the producing side of projects so i know some companies where once they book the project like all they do is email the client updates and or like review of edit passes and that's it. And I know other ones where sometimes somebody on the client end is almost like a line producer on the project and helping organize locations or personnel and stuff like that. So do you guys commonly operate one way or the other or does it just kind of flex for you based on the project? I'm interested in this question too. So I'm going to let the other two guys handle this. <laughs> I'm interested as well. I guess for me, it, it's going to depend on the client, but it's also going to depend on how well I've done to lead them in the project. I've noticed if I don't step up and set clear expectations and kind of lay out what's going on and what my expectations are of them and myself, that they'll often step in, depending on the personality, they'll step in thinking that there's something that needs to be done. And all of a sudden they're find themselves managing or producing the project. So I know that it's kind of two part depending on who they are, but then it's also how well I've done. Yeah, I would say like it really does de depend on the client. And sometimes it's also, it can be a cost savings thing at times of like if the if the client is able to come in and help produce, but also is a, a variable and an unknown of, oh snap, they don't know how to produce a video project because this is not what they do. So and that's backfired a couple times. <laughs> but um, that doesn't mean it's not always, it doesn't work out in the end or isn't possible to do. It's just know that going in that, yeah, it doesn't always work out. Um, but I would say like that, that would say that on the pre-side and then on post, there's definitely um, a lot of feedback given lots of times. Um with projects, you know, a lot, a lot of what I do as well, like I don't do a ton on the video side. I do a lot more management on like graphic design side of things. So lots of times there's back and forth feedback on that. And that's a lot easier than a video project because there's a lot less moving pieces. You know, you're not having to coordinate with an audio guy over here or a, you know, colorist over here. But it's just, it really depends sometimes. And it also depends on the deadline, how close you are to the deadline. If you're just like, sorry, this is what I got, <laughs> you know, you got to go with it. Um, but yeah, that's what I would say. And then, and circling back, I think Hunter mentioned it, you know, having revision uh, of revision limit can also be a big uh, factor with helping with that of like, if you do bring them on as, you know, giving feedback, it also caps them out that they have to 
give revision and just be happy with whatever they end up with unless they're willing to pay more money basically so i'd be interested to know um how y'all like at what point do you get the client's input on edits when do you bring them in is it when you have a nice finished product ready to go and you have put all this time into it or is it you know rough draft first draft of the timeline or is it somewhere in between which is what i'm guessing um at what point do you let your client see the product and start giving feedback i can go first if you want me to ethan <laughs> yes please um i would say again surprise surprise it varies um but um usually what we'll do is if it's if it's a client that we've worked with but we're doing something new for them we're much usually much more likely to let them see a little bit more rough behind the scenes sausage you know how is this actually turning out is this what you because wanted? you have that trust already right. built in right right mm -hmm. and they know a little bit of our process um so like a great example is like you know if we're doing a a product feature video you know it's highly technical there's a lot of specs being given so lots of times we'll send that off to the client to be like hey how do you like the, are these titles and what's being said is this accurate you know because sometimes the presenter doesn't get it exactly right there's not always a script so they're doing it off the cuff all this stuff and so we'll send it to them to be like hey let your engineers look at this get it you know, make sure there's nothing that's wrong in this. And then we get it back and then we do our final pass of color, sound, any edit notes they have. And then like titles, you know, getting them tracked into the shots and all that. Because if they come back with a note about, you know, a title being wrong, you know, or misspelling or something like that on a, on a product, you know, then that's a whole nother, you have to get whoever did the titles to open up the project and everything. Whereas we might be able to just avoid that by just sending a revision and then doing a quick change when we're doing the initial ant tracking and animation. So there's that. But then also like for bigger projects, I know that we sometimes try to get more of a polished, like, Hey, this is a rough draft with maybe no color, no sound temp music. And, but it's a lot more polished, I would say state. Um, so that way they can get a feel for it a lot more. Um, and then some clients are just like, here's the final product, <laughs> you know, <laughs> be happy, you know? <laughs> so I think it really does depend on the relationship and like, again, circling back to it all really boils down to the, those opening meetings, you know, back and forth. Like, how do you feel like that's going to be that dynamics going to be once you give them, you know, what, you know, something in progress, are they going to be, had giving a ton of notes that's like sorry we really can't do anything about that now or what the deal is so yeah no i love i love timothy's answer there and i think mine is is one of those answers that he gave in there but just the it's more of a polished edit but it's still got temp music it probably doesn't have a color grade the titles are probably just uh just in there temporarily that way, and I try to be clear about, okay, here's what we have done, here's what we have not done, just so otherwise they're gonna be, hey, you're missing this, you're missing this, this doesn't look good. So I try to be clear about that, just so that they know what we're working on. But then ask for their feedback on whatever aspects that I feel good about, so that if there's something that we can't update at this stage, then we can get that updated in there. But uh, yeah, it does It does kind of depend, because there are certain clients who I won't send anything but a finished, finished edit, otherwise, yeah, they'll point out every little thing that's not that's not done yet. Uh, so I think if you've worked with them before, you'll probably have a feel for that. Otherwise, I try to get them a polished edit, but not final. That's good. That is uh, similar to what I do. So right now, what I do with a certain client I'm working on working with right now um, is that I will send them a uh, an edit where I feel like the story is there and all the B-roll is there. And like, I, I, I'm very happy with the edit and the way it flows and everything. Um, I usually work with, I don't work with a composer. So usually the music I choose is the music um, unless they strongly dislike it. Um, but that is the, you know, I'm like, I'm presenting it as kind of a final product in a way, but I don't really touch color. I don't really touch graphics yet. Um, I will put temp graphics in there and I will put an overall, you know, a LUT basically so that they can see it. And I'll just ask for their feedback on color. And also I don't really do any 
audio work. You know, I make sure the levels are correct. And if people are talking, they can be heard and the music isn't blaring or anything like that. I'll sometimes put some sound effects in there. Um, but that's kind of what I do with most of my clients. Um, but I love y'all's answers because they're a little bit more nuanced and it, I, I can see where it does depend on the client and the relationship you have with them, how much they trust you. And so, yeah, so those are good and, answers. And, and I would also add, you know, it also depends on what the working relationship is with the client, you know? Mm -hmm. So like take for our features film, you know, you're going to maybe be meeting with a studio exec exec you know that is you know maybe one meeting and you're showing them the final product you know that's the thing that you're showing but you might have to run it by legal or something like that before then or you know someone else from the studio type of thing and so there's a lot more it's like almost the bigger the scale the project is they're more like levels of like getting it feedback and everything goes through but it just really depends on everything with the client you know and so yeah that would, that's all i had to add on that heard that so one thing that because i've recently been doing a little bit more post managing as well that i've seen is sometimes it also depends on what your deadline is if it's like this is a hard deadline because they have to have a video for this big event um then maybe we're starting to show it to them earlier because we don't have that time to make a big pivot if they don't like the way things are looking or going. But if it's a project where they're like, oh yeah, as long as it's done by the end of the year, because we're not releasing it until the first quarter of, you know, 2025 and we're at like August, then maybe we work and get it more polished because we have that buffer zone in as well. How do y'all determine who the decision makers are? Like, do you set a limit of how many cooks there are in the kitchen when it comes to that post work? Um, I, I think it, again, it varies a little bit by project and also like how much you really want to, um, how um important the project is in a sense of like, oh snap, we really got to make this good. Um, Because if it's in an internal pro video or something like that, it's like, I mean, <laughs> yeah, we'll just make, we'll make it good, but it doesn't need to go through 10 revisions, you know, but um, something that I'm a big personal, huge fan of personally is I love getting feedback from people that I trust. Um, and, you know, when in the development, the feedback process. And so sometimes that does include the client. Sometimes the client is one of those people that's like, Hey, yeah, you actually got the, the you know what your target audience is and so you can actually speak to things that i'm not going to notice um but very much having someone ultimately that is you know the buck stops here both on the production side and client side so if the client brings in people for review there's this one person that does make the ultimate decision that is hey yeah this is the way it's going to be as well as on the you know on us as the contractor side who you know what that where that buck stops, you know, and so, um, so that way you even with all this noise of feedback, you can pick, you know, that person can pick and choose what they're going to implement. Um, so that way doesn't become too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, now granted, it's a mental load on that person that's doing that, that they have to sort through all that. But I've seen so many times where it's really aided a project more than hindered it. And so that's where I tend to lean, lean like, sort of lean into is, getting feedback from a lot of people that you do trust basically um, and going from there. Wives are very good about telling you, uh, you know, being, being honest with you. So, Oh yes. Hot tip there. No, that's good. That's good. I, uh, I don't know that I have a ton to add to that because it's definitely not my strong suit finding out today. The decision maker up front. I do think it is helpful just having that conversation as you're, scoping out the project as you're onboarding the client. Um, if you can bring it up in a way that's, I know I did it once and it came across as offensive because like, so who's really in charge of this project? So you got to do it tactfully, <laughs> but uh, just figuring out who it is that we also have to get approval from just so you can go into it knowing that. And then when you send over the revision, you can kind of indicate that, you know, it'd be great or send over, sorry, send over the, the rough draft or the fine draft, wherever you're at, that, uh, that they get eyes on that as well. Mm-hmm.
yeah, I think if there's a way you could figure out how to figure out who the decision makers are going to be in their respective fields and then understand who those people are. And then if your client is comfortable with it, reaching out to those people directly within the company so that you can limit the amount of, you know, through the grapevine communication that happens. Uh, that's not always the case. Uh, I have a client right now where, you know, I'm just going through the one one person and she gets it to all the different departments who need to have a look at it. And that's fine. Um, but just understanding where, you know, it might not be fine for other gigs. So just understanding when you start a project, maybe just asking who those people are that are going to be giving feedback and then being able to plan accordingly. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll add to that as well. Like sometimes even if you do have someone that is like, you have all these people that you have to get a project verified through, or they have to get eyeballs on, like sometimes just having a dedicated person that's like, okay, you're the one that's responsible for contacting mm -hmm. all these people. I have no idea who the, these people are or mm -hmm. their emails, you know, much less ever met them. So making sure that that's not on your plate of like, okay, have we checked with everybody? Have we checked with everybody? Have we checked with everybody? Let there be someone that's that dedicated touch point to be, actually the person that's responsible for if there is a lot of people hey have you checked with everybody yep great if not they are going to know that and let you know that um so yeah having a dedicated person if you there is a large you know if it's if it's committees or whatever that needs to go through that there's someone that is that touch point that can make sure that that happens and can see that and follow through on that well we're getting close on time here i did have two questions um left that i was hoping to to pick your guys's brains about um and so the first one especially since you know we've been dealing with uh with these last couple questions timelines and client review and a lot of that is like what advice do you guys have to get a project moving again after maybe you or the client, or maybe both of you kind of dropped the ball. Like, you know, m maybe the client was late on getting feedback and now you have other deadlines or you misunderstood something, you know, that the client was saying and went a different direction. And now you're kind of having to dive back into that edit to change it to what they wanted. I don't know if there is um, a specific way to go about this other than the way that I do it. And that is just being transparent when I have dropped the ball or misunderstood and letting the client know about that. And then, you know, just being in communication with them and just asking, you know, I mean, you can only, you can't control what they tell you, but you can control how you react or how on the ball you are with trying to get feedback from them. Um, and so just make sure that you're the one reaching out and making sure that the client is taken care of and you're not leaving that up to the client. And it might even be as simple as ju just a quick, just a quick email. Hey, how's it going? You know, did, did, did we um, complete the video to your satisfaction? And, you know, just hoping that they are um, uh, honest with you or even that they uh, they know what they wanted in the first place and hoping that you know they were clear in their expectations and and things like that in communication. So being a good communicator I think is very important in our um industry and sometimes you have to teach clients how to be good communicators as well. And so being ready to to do that you're going to have to be, and again, looking at yourself as the guide, as the Gandalf or the Obi-Wan Kenobi or whoever, you know, pick your franchise. Um, you have to, you have to be the one that initiates oftentimes and don't let that, um, don't let that scare you, you know, just step up and, and do it. And you might do it badly, but you know, it's a, it's a learning process. I'll I'll add in as well, like um, I think humility and like like Hunter was saying, like humility and being honest with the client is really important. Um, 
something that we try to do is we try to build in margin either with our budget or with time that if something goes wrong, I mean, it's not always the best approach and we're not always able to do this, but sometimes we want to be known as someone that ultimately cares about our clients enough to go the extra mile for them. So sometimes that means brute forcing it, you know, having, <laughs> pulling an all nighter or something like that. But, and, and, you know, and, you know, hopefully you've done it in such a way you've, but you've budgeted margin that, yeah, you can do that. And it doesn't end up costing the client extra. Now, that being said, you have to set boundaries for yourself because it's very easy, um, especially with clients that you thought, you know, you tried to vet and it's just not ending well that it's like, okay, we're having a lot of changes here and yet there wasn't good communication. We thought we were on the same page and apparently we weren't at all. And so we're now having to really relook at the scope of what the project was because now we're we're on a where the, the scope of the project has totally changed. And now we're having to rebudget our time and money to get this done for you. So it's always the worst when those like when that comes up because you're just like, oh man, I don't want to have to have this conversation. But the reality is you do have to have that conversation because if you don't, then you're going to end up in a lot of trouble of being overworked and having trouble meeting deadlines for your other clients. So yeah, I would so I'd just to sum it up, basically for us, we just try to make it whenever possible, make it happen for the client by building in the margin to be able to do that. Um, and when that can't be done, we then have that conversation of, hey, here's what we're looking at, how we need to adjust from here. So then uh, to wrap this up, I, I'd love to kind of hear from you how you guys go about building community outside of kind of the commer your commercial film industry for when you're not gone and on projects. Cause I, especially this past year, I found it was very different from, you know, the feature life where it's like, you just get used to, you're gone for, you know, six weeks and then you're back here, you know, in, our, in the commercial space, it's like, well, I might be gone for a week and back for half a week and then gone again. And, that can be just as challenging when you're trying to like quickly get reintegrated just to leave again. I want to hear what, um, you know, <laughs> Ethan and Timothy have to say about this and even you, Micah, um, but I'm not gone from the Dallas Fort Worth area that often. Like I don't travel very much. I did, I did a couple of trips to DC and then to Nashville last year maybe three trips total, but mostly I am here in the Dallas Fort Worth area. So um, I will say though, that oftentimes um, I just sent an email this morning to our church small group because they always meet on Saturdays and I'm usually filming weddings on Saturday. And so I was like, Hey, is there any way we can do this on a weekday or something? So I think my main community are the friends I already have. And then through church, and I have determined that I wasn't going to work on Sundays, that Sundays was for worship and for family time. And so that is one way how I stay sane. I've had to turn down some gigs, but, you know, that's the way it is. And um, I think it's just being intentional about um, your time and what you need as a person and as a, you know, follower of Christ, we're meant to be, I believe we're all meant to be in community, especially if you're a Christian in the church community. And so just making sure that that is a priority in your life. I'm probably very bad at um, balancing all of that. So I'd be interested to hear from, from Ethan and Timothy, especially regarding with, you know, what you guys do for travel. I know Ethan, you travel a lot as well. So I'm, I'm listening. Yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess for me, I do quite a bit of travel. Um, thankfully my church is pretty good about welcoming me back from the travel. So it's usually a lot of, a lot of small group, home group stuff with church, uh, get togethers there. I also ho host a book chat so I can schedule that whenever I want to. So that works out pretty well. Uh, but yeah, it is definitely something you have to be intentional about because I know, especially for me, it's easy to spend extended lengths of time you know, playing with or learning a new feature tool inside a software, a new camera, whatever. Um, so yeah, making it a priority to get out and to spend time with other people. Um, yeah, it's important. Yeah. I mean, I, I think 
the reality is, is because it's not, this is not a standard nine to five job by any means. Um, there's always going to be flex, you know, um, you know, in the church community, you know, we, we, my wife and I, we always try to make it a point that, you know, we try to take Sundays off, but the reality is, you know, I, I, I was for a while working at my church and the reality was is Sundays were not that restful for me. You know, mm-hmm. I was actually we're doing my paid work on Sunday, you know? And so I think the important thing is if, you know, you know, it's great. And I, you know, that people do take time off at set times, but sometimes life happens that it doesn't happen exactly in the way you plan it. So what's been really important for um, my wife and I um, to do is to make sure that time happens regardless of where it is in the week. You know, it's good to get systems and rhythms into place, but you know, if there's an appointment that could only be scheduled on a certain day, you know, then that's not going to throw off. Yeah. That's not going to pull from our quality time as a family together. Um, so, you know, in the case of like, if someone's doing a lot of travel, you know, my recommendation would be, Hey, make sure that you are spending time. uh, That's the correct amount of time for whatever you're at, you know, for you, it is, you know, for me, it's, it's, I've got a family, so I have to spend more time sewing into them and then additional time sewing into my wife on top of trying to connect myself into community, you know? Um, so that is something I have to budget for. If I'm going to leave on a trip, I have to spend the equal amount of time sewing into those things. So making sure that whenever you're planning projects or looking at schedules and everything that you're allowing that time, you know, and that means you have to say no lots of times, like Hunter was saying, like it's, there's lots of times you're just like, sorry, I can't do this, you know? And so it's not always a clear cut answer, but the definite thing I would say is it has to be a part of your planning process because otherwise it won't happen. You have to be intentional about it. So. Yeah, I will say it also depends on where you are in your stage of life. You know, I am, I'm married and I have a kid at home now. And so I want to spend more time with them. Um, And I do wish that sometimes I do wish not that I wasn't married or didn't have a kid, but that I had as much time when I was single to work on some of these projects. And, you know, so, you know, if, if you're single out there, then, you know, take the time right now to, to build your, um, your skill set. you know, work those long nights or whatever. And, you know, I think that that's great. And then there will be a season when maybe you don't do that as often. And, um, you know, just being, I guess, giving yourself a little bit of grace and realizing um, that you're, you are in, you might be in a busy season and that sometime you might be in a not busy season. You can spend more time with your, your friends and family and that's okay. You know, as long as you are using wisdom and getting feedback from the people you love and that are in your life and making sure that you're not um, ignoring anybody or letting relationships um, deteriorate because of your job, then, you know, um, I'm sorry, my wife just called me and I realized my phone did was not on silent. I was super embarrassed. And now that my train of thought just went out the window. Um, I will, I'll add like, that's a great point as well with like, you know, their seasons. Cause like that was, that's, we've been for the last couple of years, we've had some pretty major seasons. My wife and I, you know, we're both in the creative space. And so we've definitely had some definite seasons of like, yeah, we're having, we're pulling really late nights, you know, for us, one of the things was, cause we both work from home, you know, we would, you know, we would be waking up, you know, pretty late sleeping in, but then, you know, we have our daughter that's up and around during the day. And then when she goes to bed, that's our work hours, you know? And so working very strange hours for parents was a thing for a little bit there, you know, working until two or three in the morning of um, <laughs> getting up and doing it all over again, which is like, I, that's not sustainable whatsoever, but that was the season that we were in. And I, I look back at that of, Oh yeah, that was hard, but like, I wouldn't really do it differently. Um, so yeah, recognizing that there's seasons, you know, even if you are married or single, wherever that there's work that's more and then lulls. The other thing I would say as well is like something that we've had to be intentional about with community is, like my wife and I, we both, we work from home and we're literally working sometimes across from each other on a couch or something like that. 
But the reality is, is that's not quality time. So I'd say like, you know, we have to be intentional about, okay, yeah, we're going to go spend quality time together. So for us, we've had to learn just because you're spending time together with the community or, you know, with your spouse or family does not mean it's actual quality time. And so with keeping track of community, make sure that the time that you're spending is actually beneficial and like quality, you know, sometimes that means, okay, yeah, you need to look for a new community to get plugged into. That's a better helping you stay connected, you know, whether you're a Christian or whatever your interests are, you know, if you enjoy gaming or whatever, you know, making sure that you're getting growing as a person and, you know, ultimately really, it's really boils down community boils down to growing as a person. So making sure that you actively are growing, you know, and plugging into a community that's helping you grow. So. Yeah. And I think the only thing I would add on to that is with the relationships that you're, that you have or, or uh, groups that you're in, try to invest in those, even when you're gone traveling or whatnot, uh, cause that will go a long ways to, I know it feels like I'll be gone for a couple of weeks and get back and it's like, Oh, I'm starting all over. But you know, the more you can do to reach out while you're out and stay in touch and uh, yeah, it'll keep the relationships going. We will go ahead and wrap up this episode. Uh, but thank you all for coming back onto the producer podcast and uh, letting me put you under the the microphone again. Thanks for having us. I appreciate it. Micah. Yeah. Thanks, Micah. And with that, we're going to wrap up another season of the producer podcast. A big thank you to all of our guests for taking time to come on this season. Make sure to stay tuned for more episodes of the producer podcast highlights coming this summer and season nine releasing this fall. In the meantime, make sure to pick up your copy of The Producer's Life, A Guide to Practical Film Producing by show host Micah Versman for many more great insights on the world of producing. Until next time, make sure to subscribe to The Producer Podcast, and thanks for listening.